All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Friday Ramblings. We are here for a very uh, special episode. Not going to be too up at first because this is one of those episodes that we unfortunately have to do every so often, and that is we are eulogizing the recently deceased superstar Billy Graham, one of the all-time classic professional wrestlers. Um, it's been a couple weeks now since his passing. Um, as usual, I very rarely, um, like to rush these out. I know a lot, mostly because I know a lot of people are rushing to put out condolences and memorial videos. I kind of like to do things at my own pace, get my thoughts going, make sure I'm doing this. In a way that reflects Rule Life Productions in the best way possible. Not just rushing out to be part of the original wave of people. I'm me. I do things at my own pace. That's what makes this channel so special. But yes, Superstar Billy Graham. A highly influential wrestler. And we are going to break things down. But first, because this is... Uh, discussing the recently deceased, we are going to get into a bit of the man behind it. Born Eldridge Wayne Coleman Jr. on June 7th, 1943 in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Billy Graham did die on May 17th, 2023 at the age of 79. And was survived by his spouse, Valerie Coleman, and his two children, um, his daughter, Capella, who was born in 1972, and his son, Joey, who was born in 1975. Uh, officially, for the record, because again, we are just discussing everything here. Um, these were Valerie's stepchildren, as Graham had had them from a previous marriage to Madeline Meluso. Uh, Graham and his wife Valerie were never uh, were never able to have children of their own. And should note, Joey's godfather is uh, wrestler Dusty Rhodes, which will factor into, you know, uh, Billy Graham's wrestling career. And we are for ease going to refer to him as Billy Graham from here on out because that's what the world knows him as, and we are primarily going to be focusing on his career. So, just keeps everything good to go. Uh, before we get into his wrestling career, we do want to know because it was kind of a part and parcel tied in together, his uh, bodybuilding career. He had begun bodybuilding a few years before he got into professional wrestling, uh, continued to, in his early uh, years of his professional wrestling career, work with the bodybuilding community, and it was the inspiration to bring this bodybuilder physique with the over-the-top charisma that really helped him stand out at that time in professional wrestling. Um, in the bodybuilding world, he won the West Coast Division of the Mr. Teenage America Bodybuilding Contest. Uh, for reference, Frank Zane won the East Coast Division, uh, causing him to soon after appear in the iconic Strength and Fitness magazine. Uh, Coleman also trained at Gold's Gym in Santa Monica, where he worked out with Dave Draper, Franco Columbu, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And at the time was bench pressing 605 pounds, 11 pounds short of the world record held by his other friend, Pat Casey. Uh, Coleman's photo shoots with Arnold would appear in the also iconic Muscle Fitness Magazine, which I believe is still in print today. This being done by Joe Weider, who, I don't know, um, may have to discuss Joe Weider with my partner uh, one day, as 
you know, that's... Joe Weider gets more into the um, boxing, MMA, bodybuilding world, and that's a little more his style. But remember Joe Weider. He's worth remembering. There will be other videos discussing him later. Um, as he became a professional wrestler, I said he continued to weight train. And in 1975, at the World Bodybuilding Guild's Pro Mr. America contest in New York City, he showed up with 22-inch biceps and won first place in the Best Developed Arms Division. And in 1980, at a peak weight of 325 pounds, took part in the World's Strongest Man competition in Great, Go Great Gorge, New Jersey, finishing 7th in the contest in spite of injuring himself in one of the earlier events. Uh, later that year, he would host the U.S. Invitational Powerlifting Championship in Phoenix, Arizona. But now let's get on to the stuff we all know we came here for, and that is his professional wrestling career. The career started with Stu Hart, who trained the future superstar as part of the earliest era of the Stampede Wrestling promotion. Debuting in 1970 in a match with Dan Crawford. Briefly wrestling under his real name of Wayne Coleman, the superstar would travel back to the United States in May before wrestling with Dr. Jerry Graham, Brick Darrow, Rick Cahill, and Ron Pritchard in Arizona, uh, traveling, before traveling with Jerry to join the NWA's Los Angeles promotion as a tag team. He then changed his ring name to Billy Graham, both as a tribute to the famous Evangelist and also so that they could be billed as the Graham Brothers. Of course, the Graham Brothers would eventually grow into a full-on grouping featuring different variants of brothers team teaming together. Besides Jerry and Billy, there's also Luke and the iconic Eddie Graham, who's definitely getting his own video one day. Because Eddie Graham did a huge lot in wrestling history. Uh, it was also while teaming with Jerry that Superstar began dyeing his hair blonde, which he would keep throughout basically the rest of his wrestling career. Thus, the iconic look is starting to come together. Eventually, Billy Graham would go off on his own to join Rory Shire's NWA San Francisco promotion, working with Pat Patterson, Ray Stevens, Cyclone Negro, and Peter Maivia. He would also wrestle in the Hawaiian Territories while working out of California. And it was during this period that Graham developed a new aspect of his character, staging an arm wrestling contest for his matches, claiming to the public that he had the title of arm wrestling champion of the world. Now, obviously, with his bodybuilder physique and prowess, he would beat, you know, regular Joe Schmoes in the audience. Ultimately, he would move on to the American Wrestling Association header. Um, headquartered out of Minnesota where he would feud with promotion owner Vern Gagne along with Hall of Famers The Crusher and The Bruiser Wahoo McDaniel, Billy Robinson, Ken Patera and Ivan Koloff eventually teaming with Ivan. Graham would also vary up the arm wrestling contests by occasionally doing weightlifting challenges especially against uh, ex-Olympian weightlifter Ken Patera and posing routines. His most memorable and violent feud in the AWA was against Wahoo McDaniel. Ultimately though Graham would take time off from the AWA to join the International Wrestling Alliance's uh, super wide series tour of Japan 
where he would fight wrestling legends in Japan such as Mighty Inu, Animal Hamaguchi, and Russia Kimura before teaming up with Dusty Rhodes. He eventually uh, settled down in Red Bastion's Dallas-based NWA promotion, feuding with Mad Dog Vachon over the Brass Nux title, before working for a spell in Mid-Atlantic, subbing in for a young Ric Flair after the infamous plane crash that put Rick out for several months. Eventually though, Superstar Billy Graham would f go to the home he is most associated with and that is the World Wide Wrestling Federation. Showing up in 1975 in a tag match at the Boston Garden, teaming with Spiros Arion, defeating then heavyweight champion Bruno Sammartino and Dominic DiNucci. During this time, Billy Graham would gain the Grand Wizard as his manager. After a short trip to the um, Houston, Texas, NWA territory, Graham went on another tour of Japan, this time bringing Ivan Koloff with him and feuding with Antonio Inoki. In November, on the invitation of former tag partner Dusty Rhodes, Graham joined the NWA promotion in Florida, beating Rhodes for the Florida heavyweight title in Palm Beach. He would also occasionally visit the iconic St. Louis territory, where he would take on NWA world heavyweight champion Harley Race. The number of men that Billy Graham is beating that are considered some of the greatest of all time is rapidly checklisting, isn't it? Check, 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 check. Woohoo! Ultimately, though, upon returning to the WWF, Graham would defeat Bruno San Martino in Baltimore, Maryland, cementing his heel status by putting his feet on the ropes to gain unfair leverage. During this reign, he wrestled across America and Japan, going up with rematches against Bruno San Martino, along with icon Jack Briscoe, his old partner and rival Dusty Rhodes, Pedro Morales, Don Morocco, Mil Mascara, Strong Kobayashi, and Ricky Choshu, among others. On January 25th, 1978, Miami, Florida, at the Orange Bowl Football Stadium, Billy Graham would wrestle against the NWA World Heavyweight Champion Harley Race in a World Champion versus World Champion unification match which ended in a one hour time limit draw. Graham eventually did lose the title to Bob Backlund in February of 1978 which means he held it for about 10 months. This would make him, while nowhere near the championship length reign of Bruno San Martino, still a respectable reign, and one that would certainly help his career as he could now claim he was one of only a couple people to have beaten Bruno straight up in a match. And the fact that Bruno did not win the title back from him spoke volumes. Deciding without the belt that there wasn't much point in him staying in the territory, though, Graham joined Paul Bosch's NWA promotion in Houston, Texas, as well as working in California and Florida, eventually heading out for a third tour of Japan. Graham then became the Continental Wrestling Association world champion, defeating Pat McGinnis. Continental Wrestling Association, of course, being a Memphis territory run by Jerry Jarrett. Ultimately, Graham would lose the belt to Jerry Lawler in Lexington, Kentucky. And took a bit of a break in 81. 
only wrestling a handful of matches before going to another tour of Japan in 82 and beginning to incorporate martial arts moves into his repertoire as part of his constant pursuit of staying cutting edge. Graham will return in the WWF focusing on his new martial arts moves and sporting a new look, having lost a lot of his muscle mass, as well as shaving his head bald and adding a mustache. Graham later stating he did this to retire the superstar character out of frustration that he was not allowed to turn babyface in the WWF. After his return, he attacked Backlund, destroying the physical championship belt as a way of setting up challenges to Bob Backlund. However, he was unable to win the title and left after several months. Superstar then returned to the AWA, regaining his muscle mass and iconic superstar figure for journeying back down to championship wrestling from Florida, helping out Kevin Sullivan and his army of darkness for turning against them and feuding with Sullivan and his minions. Graham then went back, went back to Mid-Atlantic Wrestling in North Carolina, working with Paul Jones in his feud against Jimmy Valiant. By this point, Graham had gotten to the peak of his muscle mass and had begun wearing tie-dye, growing a full goatee, keeping the mustache blonde, but letting the chin part stay his natural dark color. If this sounds vaguely familiar, you'll notice this was a look adopted by Hollywood Hogan during his WCW NWO run. Ultimately, though, in 1986, Graham will return to the WWF one more time as a fan favorite before being diagnosed with uh, hip problems that would require a f surgery and a full hip replacement. Footage of Graham's hip replacement surgery was shown in that fall of 86 as a means of promoting his comeback and keeping the babyface sympathy on him from the fans. He attempted to return in mid-1987, but the strain on his hips and ankles proved to be too much. So in October, the one-man gang in storyline retired him from active competition permanently with a running splash on the concrete floor after Graham beat Butch Reed. During the one-man gang beatdown, Don Morocco would come to Graham's aid, and Graham subsequently became Morocco's manager. However, Graham's last official wrestling match was not until November 7th in St. Louis, Missouri, but was also against Butch Reed. Graham would occasionally work for the WWF as a commentator during this period while getting further surgery on his hip and ankles. However, he would leave by 1989. Later, many years later, things got positive as Superstar Billy Graham was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2004 by then World Heavyweight Champion Triple H, whom Graham had helped inspire to become a professional wrestler. Several months later, Graham would join WWE on a swing of nine televised events where he was interviewed by Jonathan Coachman before working an angle which ended with Coachman getting knocked out by the former wrestler. Three days later, Graham would appear in Raw where he encouraged Randy Orton to do something to make himself notable. This helped cementing Randy Orton's legend killer gimmick that he had begun cultivating at this time. On October 3rd at the WWE Homecoming, Graham participated in a legend ceremony with 24 other WWE legends. 
and in January 23rd of 2006, he promoted his book and DVD for Parting Ways with WWE in 2009. However, in November 2015, Graham announced he had signed a new Legends contract, renewing it in 2021 before his passing in 2023. So let's do the quick championship rundown. NWA Hawaii Heavyweight Champion a single time, two-time Florida Heavyweight Champion, Florida Tag Team Champion with Ox Baker, Florida version of the Southern Heavyweight Championship one time, CWA World Heavyweight Championship, NW, or IWA World Heavyweight Champion, NWA Brass Knuckles Champion, NWA World Tag Team Champion out of San Francisco with Pat Patterson, one time WWW Heavyweight F Heavyweight Champion, along with WWE Hall of Fame entry, a one-time Slammy Award winner, WWE's answer to the Oscars, as well as making PWI's Most Hated Rest of the Year in 1973, Match of the Year in 1977 versus Bruno San Martino, Match of the Year in 1978 versus Bob Backlund, and ranked number 277 in the top 500 single wrestlers of the PWI years in 2003 as part of a special poll. Now it should be noted that before um, passing on, we're going to do a real quick personal note here before getting on to the full-on legacy of the superstar. And that is that before passing on in 2023, uh, superstar Billy Graham had basically spent the last uh, 20 odd years of his life fighting various health conditions besides the aforementioned uh, hip replacement surgery he had contracted hepatitis C receiving a liver transplant in 2002 um, also in 2006 had to have uh, was hospitalized to a bowel obstruction from an earlier surgery had problems with the transplanted liver in 2010 um, to the point that he had begun preparing to die at that point even purchasing his cemetery plot specifically at the Green Acres Cemetery in Scottsdale, Arizona where Eddie Guerrero is also buried. Uh, on March 11th to, or March 31st 2011, um, it was acknowledged that Grant, uh, Billy Graham was also suffering from advanced fibrosis and would require um, drugs to help slow his infections and stay in shape. It was confirmed in 2012 he had third stage liver disease and cirrhosis. In January 2013, Graham was hospitalized with double pneumonia and possible heart failure. He was later rehospitalized for liver complication in 2014. 2016, Graham was hospitalized while undergoing a medical procedure due to internal bleeding. Before in June 2022, it was announced that due to these various liver conditions that he had had problems with off and on over the years, most of them coinciding with hepatitis C, he had he was going to have his toes amputated. So it should be noted that Billy Graham did suffer a lot in the last years of his life with ongoing medical conditions. But despite that fact, he did make as many public appearances as possible for the sake of wrestling fans. And we salute him for this. Um... His official cause of death was uh, sepsis and multiple organ failure. And he is, when it comes to the legacies, the nature of the superstar gimmick, a physically impressive man with incredible charisma would be copied by various other wrestlers, including Hulk Hogan, 
later era Ric Flair, Austin Idol, Steve Austin, Scott Steiner, Triple H, and Jesse the Body Ventura. Hogan and Ventura being the most um, obvious as they their look that they cultivated as wrestlers tended to be the most directly similar to Billy Graham. Billy Graham, of course, having various taglines, including, I'm the man of the hour, the man with the power too sweet to be sour. I've been barbell plates to eat T-bone steaks. I'm sweeter than a German chocolate cake. I am the superstar Billy Graham. Graham was also famous for his character his use of the word brother in his promos, which Hulk Hogan has definitely picked up to the point that Hogan saying brother is a bit of a modern internet meme. Uh, this stemmed from Billy Graham's backgrounds attending evangelical revival meetings where everybody referred to each other as a brother or sister in Christ. Um, Graham, of course, using it to refer to his brothers inside the wrestling industry which again makes a lot of sense as many lifelong wrestlers will tell you that yeah the guys in the locker room are your family Graham himself would use steroids off and on and in his younger or his later years would lecture young athletes on the danger of steroids He uh, would touch on this in his autobiography, Tangled Ropes, as well as the DVD about Graham's years, titled 20 Years Too Soon. These are both excellent, if you want, really detailed looks into Billy Graham. Think of them as extended learning after you watch our awesome video here. But, by, and as I said, by influencing people like Steve Austin, Scott Steiner, Triple H, Hulk Hogan, Jason Body Ventura, Graham ensured that even as his wrestling career was winding down, the legacy of the superstar would live forever. Characters like this continue to exist in professional wrestling to this very day. Um, and to an extent always will because... The superstar was awesome. Everybody wanted to be the superstar, even other professional wrestlers. Now, of course, Billy Graham, being a very um, upfront man who took his business very seriously, hence him cultivating his superstar character and, as we mentioned briefly, uh, retiring it for a short uh, num for a short period of time when he felt like what the promoter wanted to do with him would not help the superstar persona and going with Karate Master Billy Graham. Um, Billy Graham would have various disputes with the McMahons in the 90s, specifically in the early 90s during uh, Vince McMahon Jr.'s uh, steroid trial in federal courts. Graham himself would go on to various public awareness campaigns regarding the dangers of steroids, appearing on the Phil Donahue show, and various others. Graham also spoke out against Linda McMahon during her 2010 Senate campaign, claiming that she was distancing herself from the racy attitude era style programming that she profited from while acting as CEO for WWE to the point that he, he accused her of even trying to deny how much she was involved in what the company put out on television as a product. However, a few years later, as his liver condition worsened, he did reach out and apologize to the McMahons Recognizing that you don't you don't want to go to your end with that kind of anger holding on to you. St 
still, when it's all said and done, what do we? What can you say about Billy Graham? He was a good family man. He was married a couple times, but he was his marriage to his wife Valerie lasted a very good long while. As we said, he was. Uh, let me see what was that. Uh, they were married in 1978 and uh, remained married till his last days. So, you know, good on you. Good long marriage. Many decades. More props. Um, he, you know, as I said, he had two children that, by all reports, he did his best by. And that he's, you know, he loved like a good father. And when it comes to professional wrestling... He did it all. He was an early example of an American that worked multiple tours in Japan. He worked against uh, Mexican stars like Mil Mascaras. He worked in all over North uh, the United States for the NWA, the AWA, the WWWF, the WWF. He worked up in Canada for Stu Hart. That's where he got his start. Uh, basically, if there was professional wrestling with an audience he would go there and perform for him and he had and he cultivated a character very quickly of the superstar that everybody wanted to see it was a character that got over in all parts of the country and that was impressive and even when the character was put aside because it was time for a fight he could go as violent as anybody in his time Guys like Dusty Rhodes and Wahoo McDaniel that got over by, you know, fighting bloody matches until people were surprised they hadn't dropped down and, you know, potentially even dropped dead from blood loss and just the massive beating they took. Hey, Billy worked some of those matches against them. So for all of that, on the personal side, on the professional side, well, yes, Billy Graham did at times let his temper get the best of him, make accusations that didn't need to be made, say things in public that didn't need to be said. He would seek forgiveness for those un, you know, actions that were over the line over time. And when it's all said and done, he was a good man. He worked hard, and he earned every bit of fame, celebrity, and influence over the modern wrestling product that he has. For that, we salute you, Billy. And may you uh, enjoy your time in the hereafter. We will be back. We are here every Friday. Make sure you subscribe. Click your notification bells. Because there's a lot more topics to talk about. And hopefully next week it will be a little more entertaining. As I said kind of a cloud hanging over these these episodes but these are things I, I feel I need to talk about as a huge wrestling fan you know I, I kind of needed to, to talk about Billy to help me come to terms with the fact that it's like yeah it's, you know he, he's gone he hung on for a long time towards the end of his life despite a lot of health problems but, you know, it's time for his story to end. But again, we will see you in seven days. Hopefully we will not be uh, doing any more memorializing episodes for a while. Because we want everybody to stay happy, stay healthy, and stay entertained. Because Roulette Productions is your home for everything entertainment. Bye-bye.